This is Leaders in the Trenches, and your host today is Gene Hammett. Hi, this is Gene Hammett. I'm the host of Leaders in the Trenches. My question today is, how do you have better one-on-one meetings with your employees? Better one-on-one meetings means you actually are coming to the meeting not to just get insight around what's going on and, and then figure out how to best serve them. You are actually having it in your hands before the meeting starts. And there's really no other way to do that than to have some pre-work done. Now, I'm sitting down with David Hassel today. David is the founder of 15.5, and that really is a software that will help you become more prepared for those one-on-one meetings. We talk about the power of culture in today's economy, about how things are changing so fast and why you must create culture just as much um, emphasis on that as you do your product, as your sales, as your marketing, your customer service, and what comes first. He answers the, the question about what's more important for a leader, employees or customers. You might not be surprised, but tune in to find out the answer. Now, here's the interview with David. Hi, David. How are you? I'm great, Gene. How are you? I am fantastic. Well, I've already let our audience know a little bit about who you are, so it would be great for you to tell them in your own words about you and who you serve. Yeah, so I'm David Hassel, CEO of a company called 15.5, uh, and we build performance management software for companies between, say, 100 and 1,000 employees with a whole different paradigm of how to do business. So our belief is that Performance management is a bit of a misnomer. We, I believe that performance is a byproduct and it's a result of focusing on other things. Uh, and our view is when you create cultures inside organizations and support managers with the right practices, you can help people be and become their best selves over time, uh, in which we believe performance and loyalty are the byproduct of that. I totally agree with that. I have talked hundreds of times on this very podcast around the importance of uh, really going beyond performance and really looking at how an organization and the best way I've described this is, is creating growth leadership or in a growth culture. Yeah. I, I would love for you to, to tell us in your words, uh, why is culture so important in today's age? You know, I think um, we're, we're in a, we're in a world now where people are now taking it seriously. I would think even 10 years ago, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of business leaders and many of them and, uh, traditionally more, you know, traditional businesses would roll their eyes and, you know, they had a, they, they didn't have a quite an, under, uh, an understanding of the importance of culture, but I think it's absolutely everything. Uh, you can take the same person, they could be a high performer, uh, and put them in two different cultures and they're going to show up completely differently because the culture is, is it's, this, it's, it's invisible. We can't see it, but we can feel it. But it's made up of things like our, our shared beliefs and our, uh, the, the ways we do things together and, 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 and our social norms and all these other, other things, and including you know, what our standards are, what our standards of integrity are, what our standards of authenticity are, how we communicate with each other, how we do everything. And, uh, and, and it, it's, it's, it's the source of, of all action and all results. And you went with, uh, you know, putting a, the person in a different uh, context. I'm, I'm going to ask you from a strategy standpoint, because a lot of people go, oh, well, you just take the right strategy yeah. and, uh, and execute on that with, with, you know, hard work and all of that stuff. But what is your perspective on strategy versus culture? I think they, I think they, they nest. I think it's culture first, then it's strategy, right? Then it's action. And so, um, you know, if you're just focusing on the strategic and the tactical levels, uh, and you don't have the, because the people are the people who are going to take the actions inside that strategy. I don't care if you have, you know, the best strategy in the world. If you don't have people who are committed to the, big, the higher purpose, right, who are acting with integrity, who are uh, intrinsically motivated, right, you, you're going to lose every day, even to a company that maybe doesn't have as good a strategy, but has all that dialed in. You know, when you, when we first talked a couple of weeks ago about our companies and, you know, where we can make this fit, uh, I share with you some of my research and I want to bring that up here again today. I've talked with over 300 fast growing companies, the leaders of those companies. And, you know, I asked them one key question. And this question is as a leader, what's more important employees or customers? Yes. Right. What do you think it is? Well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, they're both essential, <laughs> right? You're not going to have a business unless you have both. Um, but in terms of uh, priority, I, I would always prioritize, prioritize the employees first, because if you create a, 
a really great employee base and um, and they're they're the ones who are interfacing with their customers they're the ones who are who are doing the deals who are bringing the customers in who are building the relationships and uh, you know it's apparent um, when you go to the airline counter and, and, and the differences between the different airlines you check in with you know which of those companies are employee first and which of those companies are uh, quote customer first and to my experience with the cu customer first airlines tends to be that I have a worse experience as a customer <laughs> because uh, it flows down that way right it seems like the people that are really happy with what they're doing day in and day out have more of a spring in their step they do when they deliver whether it be sales or marketing or anything um, when you are putting together your software. We, I want to talk about why you've developed this, this software, but what gap did you see in the market that allowed you to create a solution like you have today? It wasn't necessarily a gap per se. It was more, um, uh, well, I, I guess it was a gap. So I used to do strategy consulting for CEOs and their leadership teams. And I would run these all day processes that anywhere from one to four times a year where we'd help them get clear on their core purpose, their vision, their values, the, the objectives they were focusing on in any given period of time, whether it be a year or a quarter. And I'd come and check in with these companies, uh, you know, months or, months or a year later. And, you know, there was no shortage on clarity on what they wanted to do by the end of the, that day that I worked with them. Uh, but a full 50% would come back not having achieved their objectives. And I realized it was all about the people that they had, right, the team and the culture. And I had this belief that, uh, the manager-employee relationship was the critical relationship inside organizations. If we could, if we could improve that dynamic, to have managers really be in a supportive role of their people, to understand what's going on for them, and to really be outstanding managers, we could transform cultures from the inside out. So that's what we started building. What was what did that first look like when you launched um, fifteen five? Yeah, it was, it was a very basic tool, uh, which the, it's still the core of, of the 15.5 platform, what we call the weekly check-in. And it's based on an old practice the founder of Patagonia used to, uh, uh, used to do that he called 515s, where he'd have every employee in the company spend 15 minutes a week writing a report that takes their manager no more than five minutes to read. And, you know, just around things like what's going well, what challenges are you facing, how could we improve morale, uh, an opportunity to share, you know, peer appreciation and what we, call, we now call high fives. And, you know, it's evolved into a much more full-fledged platform now, but that weekly check-in is really continues to be the heartbeat of the platform. Now, what would you say to managers and leaders out there that are doing a weekly check-in the old fashioned way, which is sit down, have a cup of coffee, take them to lunch, whatever it may be. How is your, what you do better? Well, they absolutely should do that. So uh, we're not replacing face-to-face -face, uh, communication, and those things are really critical. Um, what we're doing is streamlining that. So there's a, there's a number of uh, factors. So uh, typically, if you're going to sit down with someone, the minimum amount of time you're probably going to spend is 20 to 30 minutes with that person. And I think it's a real waste of time just to spend that time gathering updates when you can do it asynchronously. Uh, when a person has an opportunity, when an employee has an opportunity to self-reflect, and they have space to do that without the pressure of someone sitting across to them, they tend to be more forthcoming uh, and, and, and have an opportunity, especially if they tend to be more introverted in sharing you know, the full range of what's going on. Now, as, as a manager or a leader, I can go in in 30 to 40 minutes, review a team of six to eight people. I'm completely briefed on, on what's going on throughout the company. And then I can actually uh, respond asynchronously on certain topics and get more clarity, or I can loop in three to five other people in the, in the company to address a specific issue right there. Uh, as I'm doing that, I can then add things to my one-on-one -on -one agenda. So when I do have one-on-ones, we don't have to waste all that time going through all the updates. I, I'm, I'm already briefed. And we can spend that high bandwidth, uh, expensive face time on going deep on the most important strategic issues. So that's the way we see that. So it's kind of like the pre-work. Exactly. It's kind of like pre-work. Yeah. Well, yeah. I can, I can uh, really relate to that because I always want to be prepared for the meeting. So if I was doing the, 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 the reviews of the one-on-ones, I want to know what we're going to talk about as opposed to just showing up. And if I'm yeah. actually giving it, because in some cases I have been that person, uh, I wanted to be able to take my time and think about it. What are some of the things you can share with us from a data standpoint on you know, trends that are going on with this manager-employee relationship? 
Uh, I think from a, you know, from a, uh, a, a more, more of a, a broad marketplace shift, I think what we're seeing now is the, the most progressive and high performing companies today are realizing the true uh, importance of and, and, and potential of, of people and culture. And I think what you're starting to see is, you know, HR, human resources, has traditionally been focused on being more, I think, protective, um, you know, putting policies and procedures in place to, to make sure that the company's protected uh, by, you know, the one or two or three bad actors in the company. And of course, the policies, you know, apply to everybody versus being focused on how do we create uh, cultures that really bring out the best in people and attract and retain the best people. And so you're starting to see that, uh, you know, HR folks rebrand themselves as, as uh, VPs or directors of people and culture instead of, instead of heads of HR. And that started with Silicon Valley and it's progressing through uh, the workforce in the U.S. And so there's, there's a big sea change uh, in, in uh, happening. And I think it's being driven by a number of dynamics. I mean, we have the, one of the tightest labor markets we've had in a long, long time. Um, you have the millennials who have, you know, were kind of the first uh, group of, of, or first generation that were the true digital natives who've not only moved into the workforce, but are now moving into management and leadership positions. Uh, and we also have uh, companies growing more and more distributed teams, uh, more so than they have in the past. So, you know, building culture when you're not, you don't have all that face time requires, you know, uh, an even higher level of effort. All those factors are really important for people to pay attention to because it, it, they aren't going away. Right, exactly. David, you know, you work and see a lot of uh, different companies doing different strategies. What are things that people are doing and spending money on that just aren't working? Um, well, I think that one of the things that um, that leaders focus on that, that, that doesn't work is, is, is really, um, how would I say this? So, you know, just focusing on the strategy and the tactics and the end results and not going a cut deeper, right? So if, if, you're just, if you're just looking at someone's outward behaviors and their results and you're having conversations about that without understanding who is this person as a human being, what are their strengths and gifts, um, you know, what do they care about? Uh, are they intrinsically motivated? Are we creating the right culture to have this person thrive? Are they in the right role? Um, you know, do we have an organization where, where our mission, vision, values are actually really authentic and aligned to the point where everybody in the company is signed up to be a member of that company because they're, they're committed to those and they're inspired by those? Uh, you know, oftentimes I think today, you know, when you talk about mission, vision, values, a lot of people will roll their eyes. Um, because there's so many people who, who, who are, have adopted that kind of concept, but have done it so poorly uh, that we see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of organizations that are not really in alignment with, with or not authentic with what those are. Um, but when it's, when it's really practiced right, and there's, there's a deep level of authenticity, there's real power in it. I think one of the things I see most often in the mission, vision, and values is something I think your software actually addresses, which is, it happens over time. It's not a, an exercise that you do over a weekend and you That's hope right. to get it, get it all squared away and then we can move on to something else. It happens, you know, week to week, month to month, year to year and across everybody. And, you know, 15.5 really does address that very well. Yeah, and I think that that's the, you make a really good point. There was there was before I started fifteen five. One of my now uh, early advisors and investors had a company in San Francisco that I was working for, and we would always ask them to send us their mission, vision, and values beforehand, so we knew who we were speaking to in the room, and you know we, we could actually rate the values. And uh, and his, the CEO's assistant wrote back and said, "I'm sorry, I can't send them to you because we're not allowed to write them down." And I was like, well, "What do you mean you're not allowed to write them down?" He said, "Well." you know, our CEO believes that if we write them down, people are not going to remember what they are. So it, they actually, it was all word of mouth. Um, and what he was pointing to was actually quite wise because, you know, the companies that write these things down and put them on the wall and they never talk about them and no one knows what they are, right? Your culture is going to drift away from them unless you have a way to really incorporate it into the daily conversation and be something that is, that is alive in the organization. Um, the, the designing them, writing them down part is only step one. And uh, culture drifts. And if, you, if you're not like bringing people back to what those values are on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's going to drift away from that and you're going to create cynicism in the organization. 
I want to take you back to something you said that, that I don't want to bypass. You talked uh-huh. about recognition. Yes. What are you seeing as, you know, some trends and things that we should be paying attention to, to reward and recognize the, the right behaviors for our employees in our culture? Um, well, I, I think it's clear that, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the research, the social science research points to a kind of a deep core need for human beings to feel recognized, to feel like their work matters. And um, so I think we've known that for a long time. And you'll see that a lot of organizations will try to put in place things like employee recognition programs and whatnot. Uh, but more often than not, those things tend to feel a little forced. Uh, and they don't really feel fully authentic. And when you can create a culture of appreciation where people are ongoingly recognizing and appreciating each other for good work, then it's not up to the leadership to do it, right? There's no program that's needed. Uh, and that's one of the things that we, that's one of the most transformative things about the platform. We call it high fives. At the end of every week, people look around the company and say, all right, here are the four or five people I'm going to recognize this week. And all that great work gets elevated so the leadership can have a a view into it. I, I mean, I live in Sedona, Arizona. I've got offices in San Francisco, Raleigh, North Carolina, New York City, a bunch of people across Europe. And so I don't get to see the work by just walking around, but I, I log into my high five feed every week and it's incredible, all the amazing stuff that's happening. And as an employee, uh, feeling recognized, being recognized by someone else feels good, but it actually you generate also positive emotions and connections to your peers by doing the recognition. Uh, and so it really, it's, it's very transformative for culture when you build a, a culture on positivity and recognition, um, because it's not the norm. It's not where our minds tend to go first. I appreciate you sharing that with us because I think it's something that is often missed. And I see a lot of companies struggling to have any kind of recognition program whatsoever, but one that's, that really is become a part of culture is going to have more transformative uh, benefits. Yeah. Uh, David, is there anything that I haven't asked you about that really you feel like would be necessary to share with our audience today about culture? Um, I, I do. Yeah. So we're on a, we're on a big mission. I, I briefly touched on it when you asked me at the beginning what 15.5 is. Um, we have this concept that's really, really resonating with, with folks uh, out there. And, you know, we, we have an hour and 15 minute webinar we give about every two weeks on the topic. Uh, and we call it best self-management. So think that the, the term best self, best type and self. Uh, a lot of people talk about, you know, I want to be my best self. It's in the zeitgeist. That's kind of what people are talking about these days. It's, it's, it's uh, um, we believe that if you create a culture focused on what we call best self-management, which is building an environment that brings out the best in who your people already are today, right? Because I can, I can wake up this morning, maybe I exercise and meditate, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a very different day than I wake up and I get right on my iPhone, and, and, right, and then I, I get into some challenging situation, right, and I'm not in a great mental space. Um, so how can you create an environment that has people really show up as their best while putting them on a track of learning growth and development and self-introspection and whatnot so they continue to learn, grow, and evolve? And what we've found, we've got about 100 people in our company right now growing 100% year over year. Uh, we've only had two voluntar- uh, three people voluntarily leave the company ever. Um, the last person left in January because he wanted to surf and travel around the world for a year and a half surfing. So he didn't leave for another job. Uh, the last prior person was four years before that. And we've built one of the most capital efficient companies that most investors I talk to say they've ever seen. And so, you know, we've, we've, and I, I attribute it all to this concept and this, well, I, you know, it's been an experiment we run inside our company where we radically care about our people and we also radically care about performance. And, uh, you know, we're committed to everyone learning, growing and developing and, and, and thriving. And my belief is that when you actually, you know, focus on supporting your people in your organization as opposed to trying to get as much as you can from them, right? They're gonna pay back to the company in major, major, major ways. And one of the best ways we can support people is help them identify and do the, do the self-reflection to understand what are their strengths, are they aligned with their role, do they have the support to continue to learn, grow, and develop, um, and, and, and maintain that focus. And the result is high performance and loyalty. I, I appreciate you sharing that with me because I, I know that it's more than just a software that that you know had to be created there's there's a lot to it and you're doing it by walking the walk so david thanks for for sharing that with us here at leaders in the trenches 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Where could we point uh, our audience to if they wanted to get more information about what you're up to? Uh, I think I think the 15.5 blog is probably the best resource. So 15.5.com slash blog. Uh, there's a number of great ebooks on there and great blog posts that go into, go into the philosophy that we talked about here. Perfect. Well, uh, again, thank you for your insight and uh, for being here at Leaders in the Trenches. Great. Thanks for having me. Take care. Well, I love kind of conversations like this because I get to learn from people that are in the trenches and you get to learn as I ask them questions. One of the two, two things I learned here is the importance of having an appreciative culture, about having ongoing appreciation within it, not waiting for the performance review, and that really is important. The other thing I learned about is having that pre-work um, done, having, having the employee fill out information around where their struggles are, what they're working on, and how they're moving forward, and anything that will prepare you for the time you have with those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Now, that is such a great conversation. If you have any questions about the growth of your company, the culture, making it a competitive advantage, please reach out. I'd love to create more content just for you. Just tell me your question. And if you want to have a conversation, reach out to me at gene at genehammett.com. As always, lead with courage, and I'll see you next time.